Well, we bless you and your family, Ryan, you and uh, Miss Tara and Jenna and your household, and pray to God to bless you mightily today. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, Pastor Carter. Hey, praise the Lord, Karen. God bless you and your household. Praise God. Up in middle Pennsylvania. Hallelujah. May God continue to bless you mightily. And have a great day. Good morning, Terry, and your family in Colorado. God bless you, Terry. Good morning, Pastor Carter. God bless you, too. Hey, praise the Lord, Terry. God bless you. Thanks for coming on, and uh, let's worship the Lord together today. God bless you. Good morning, Tyrone, up in the Bronx. Hi, Tyrone. Yes, good morning, Pastor Carter. God bless you. Hey, praise the Lord. Thank you, man. Thank you. God bless you, too. So good to hear your voice. And may God bless you and your family, give you a mighty day, and that all your days be mighty in the Lord. Praise God. Good morning, Jackie Fisher. Hi, Pastor Carter. How are you today? Doing fine, Jackie. Good morning to you and Russell and your household. And may God bless you mightily, mightily. Thank you for joining us on the online church. There are many more on board. I want to welcome all of you who are listening to the recording. Thank you. Thank you for just taking the time out to listen to this recording. I guarantee you that this recording will bless your life for the rest of your lives. And you, you'll be able to teach others and help them to get into the kingdom of God. Praise God. I thank God for you. Thank God for the, those of you who are listening by we have cell phone, those of you who are on by computer. This is the Back to Basics online church. And wherever two or more are gathered in my name, the Lord said, there I am in the midst of them. So let's honor the Lord. Let's worship him. He's in our midst. He lives in us. And, and two or more of us are gathered. So we are uh, officially a church. Praise God the body of Christ, and let's worship him together. Let's enter into agreement to worship him together and let God be praised. I want to thank God for all of you. I want to thank God for all that he is doing in our lives, for his amazing grace, for his mercy, for keeping us healthy and strong, for providing uh, homes for a shelter, uh, excellent health and, and provision, providing jobs for us and God is doing so many things, and the many unseen things that God is doing behind the scenes in the spirit realm that the, the angels of the Lord are fighting for us all the day long, that the angel of the Lord is encamped around us. We are so blessed. God knows how to take care of his people. In a few mo moments, <clears throat> I'm going to be preaching a message entitled, what happens when a person is born again? Stay on, stay on. You might think you know it, but I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that you're going to learn some things today you've never heard before. What happens when a person is born again? I wish that every person could hear this message. I wish that every pastor could preach uh, these principles, I wish that everybody in the body of Christ would hear this and share it with others because uh, there are so many people who are lost. There are so many people who attend church and yet do not get this. So I just thank God. Thank God for giving us favor <clears throat> to present this material to us today. And I pray that you'll use it and and and. Bless others with it. So we're going to ask our, our Ryan Trogler if he would pray and lead us to the throne of grace and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us today in the name of Jesus. Uh, good morning, again, Pastor. Bless you and Miss Jackie. <clears throat> um, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for making another day. We want to thank you for uh, breathing the breath of life in us again today. Lord, we just want to... Uh, ask you to give Pastor Carter the wisdom and the knowledge to teach us your awesome word again today. Uh, we want you to bless 
this online ministry. Bless everybody that wants to come to listen to your word. And Lord, we want you to, to, to heal the sick and just cure them and lead the people to you. And we just want to have a blessed day in you because it's a day that you have made. Again, we love you, praise you, honor you, glorify you. In Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you all once again for joining uh, the online church. Praise God, praise God. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the online church is part of the body of Christ. And it's the online is another way that God has provided for us to reach the masses of people. To reach the people of uh, the Lord Jesus said, take the gospel into the whole world and teach all nations what he's given us. And so the online church is a way to reach people where the, the, the brick and mortar church cannot reach people. And so as we see ourselves a part of the body of Christ and we work together <clears throat> in agreement with the body of Christ, we're doing the will of God and thanks be to God. Thank, I thank God for counting us worthy of this calling. You and I, we're part of a mighty movement called the Online Church, and uh, we're helping people to get saved all over the world. Not only to get saved, but we're helping pastors uh, to learn the principles of God's Word and to be able to teach their congregations. And um, we have people in different nations who are watching our, our videos and are teaching their congregations these principles, and people are growing strong. So don't think that just because a handful of us gather uh, on a Sunday that nothing's happening. This is a worldwide movement, and I am excited about what God is doing. Praise God. And so on behalf of Back to Basics Ministries, we're located here in uh, Lithonia, Georgia. We just want to thank you that you are a part of this, that we're partners together. We're the body of Christ, and we're doing what the Lord has called us to do. And so we want to encourage you uh, that you be a witness for the Lord on your job, in your home, in the, the, the supermarket, in the mall, at, uh, at the gas station, wherever God sends you. Be a witness for the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. And be encouraged. Be encouraged. We serve a mighty God. There is none like him. There is none like the Lord our God. And I thank God that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Praise God. So today, as I mentioned earlier, I want to preach a message. It's more of a teaching message. And um, to me, preaching and teaching is the same thing. It's proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the word of God. And so we want to teach a message entitled, what happens when a person is born again, again? Or what happens when a person gets saved? We're going to look at some things that uh, um, many of us have not known, and these things are biblically sound. I'm going to give you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you today a list of 40 things that happen. 40 things that happen when you got born again. Four zero. Forty things. Now, I may not highlight all of them, but I'm going to give you a list of 40 things. Forty marvelous things happened when you got saved. And for those of you who are listening and you're not saved, 40 things will happen when you get saved. And I want to just say this. Uh, uh, you don't get saved by thinking about Jesus in your mind. There are millions of people all over the this nation and the world today, they assemble in church. They know how to go to church. They know how to do church. They sit up in church. They practice what the church teaches. They follow the order of worship. There are millions of people, ladies and gentlemen, who go through the same motions every Sunday. They know when they clap their hands. They know how to read the cue cards. They make a lot of noise. They get emotional. But ladies and gentlemen, the sad thing is that of the millions of people who attend church on a regular basis, many of them are not saved. You may say, well, how can you say that, Pastor Carter? Ladies and gentlemen, look around. The Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. They will know we're Christians by our love. 
with all the madness and the craziness going on, and, and, and many church folks are doing crazy things. And ladies and gentlemen, when a person is truly born again, there's a change that takes place. There are people who've been going to church for 30, 40 years, and they die, and, and, and some preacher preaches them into heaven. I don't preach people into heaven because I don't have a heaven to preach you into. But many of the people who are sitting up in church right now, they know how to do church. They've been going to church all their lives. They've been hearing preaching. And, and then uh, uh, there are a lot of preachers. They, they preach what they call a sermon, and, 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 and many of them do not preach Christ Jesus and how people can get saved. And so people hear a good message. It tickles their ears. It makes them emotional. It makes them feel good. And they go home, and before long, before the day is over, before the day is over, then uh, they've lost everything that they have. Okay, so Ryan, check your check your system. Uh, everybody else can still hear Ryan. And so we want to address all those people who attend church but still don't know if they're saved. You know, if you ask the average Christian today, soon or shortly after they come out of church. Are you saved? They say, I don't know. Others will say, I hope so. Others will say, I sure would like to be. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Why go to church for 30 years, 40 years, and not know whether or not you're saved? You need to know today whether you're saved. And the Bible gives us proofs that we are saved and we need to know so that there be no doubt about it and and satan is blowing people out of the water because they just don't know and there are and and there are stubborn people i mean we've got some proud spirits stubborn spirits well pastor card i've been going i've been going to church for 40 years i was baptized when i was 13 and this and that so and they will fight me. They'll fight you because they don't want to hear anything. They know it all. And, and in their mind, they know about Jesus. Yes, in their minds, they know about Jesus. But in their hearts, they don't have him living there. And that's why people are doing dumb stuff, crazy stuff. That's why so many people are in doubt about salvation. So we want to clarify some things today and make sure that we know, that we know, that we know, that we I mean, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, he made it plain. He made it so plain. In fact, uh, when the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees tried to confuse him and try to mess up his message, Jesus began speaking in parables, plain, simple truths that the average person can understand. And so he still makes the gospel plain and simple. And so I want to address uh, those of you who are listening, who have been going to church all your lives but still don't know if you're saved. You've got household members who are not saved. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to get saved. You need to know that you're saved. We're going to show you how to get saved. We're going to tell you today what happens, 40 things that happen when a person gets saved. Now, I'm not going to ask you to remember all these things, but... Uh, uh, you can, you can email me, and I can send you the hard copy of the 40 things that happen when a person gets saved, or I'll play the uh, recording over and over again until you get these principles in your heart, not just in your head, but in your heart. Praise God. And so we're going to start off with uh, the four basic facts of salvation. Four facts of salvation. Okay, these are things that people need to know. Many churches do not preach this. They, I mean, I mean, you get all kinds of sermons uh, out there in church, on, on, on TV, on the Internet, wherever. Uh, you hear all kinds of sermons. I mean, they're preaching about everything. And the sad thing is most preachers today are preaching politics. Most preachers are lining up with the Republican Party. They think if they preach Republican politics, they're, they're going to get favor. 
But God is not a Republican, ladies and gentlemen, and God is not a Democrat. God is God. And, and preachers, you all need to line up with the word of God and stop trying to be politically correct and stop trying to comfort the people and appease the people. Uh, some of you preachers need to stop kissing up to people trying to be politically correct so you can be on the right side of the political spectrum. You need to be born again. I want to be on Jesus' side. Uh, I, don't, I don't preach politics, and I don't line up with any political party. I want to be lined up with the Word of God. I want, to be make, I want to make sure that my life is true to the Word of God. And so what I've been doing this year, the Lord has given me to teach you basic foundational truths, to give you base, basic foundational truths to make sure that what you're getting in the Back to Basics online church, that what you're getting is solid in the Word of God and something you can stand on, and, and, and it will last forever. You know, there, the Bible teaches us, Jesus gives the parable about two men. One built his house on sand, and one built his house on rock. And Jesus gave that message to let people know that there are people who who their lives are not solid. They're not built on solid ground. And uh, some people, they go into politics. Their, their gods are politics. Their idols are politics or famous people or rich people or money. They build their lives on uh, making money and enjoying the pleasures of this life. But Jesus says uh, the, the winds and the rains and the storms came and blew that house away because that house was not built on solid ground. And then there was a man who built his house on rock, solid rock. And the winds beat upon that house. The rains came. The storms came. The floods came. And that house stood. Jesus was giving this parable to let us know that only those whose lives are built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ will survive. Money cannot keep you Money cannot save you. Your good looks cannot save you. Your friends, your parties, these things cannot save you. Your political friends, your political connections will not save you. Your house must be built on the solid rock of Jesus. There are people who hear this every Sunday in church, but yet they still think they can make it because of their family name. Well, my mother built this church. Well, my father laid the foundation for this church. Well, my uncle was a pillar of the church. Well, my daddy is the pastor. Ladies and gentlemen, those things will not save you. The Bible says you must be born again. And, and I, I appeal, I beg you, if, if you have not been born again, then listen today and get born born again because time is winding up. I mean, people are dying by the numbers. I get uh, reports of people's deaths, friend, deaths of friends and this daily, on a daily basis. People are leaving here, and many are leaving here in an unsafe condition. And there is no excuse, ladies and gentlemen, no excuse for anybody, whether uh, uh, they're your family members or my family members or friends or anybody. There is no excuse for anybody not to be saved, especially in America with all the churches and all the ministries. There is no excuse for anybody to die and go to hell, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And so the Bible even says, thou art inexcusable, O man. And so we're building a solid foundation. All this year we're teaching foundational truths to make sure that you hear this word of God and build your house on solid rock. And Jesus Christ is the solid rock. Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so I appeal to those of you who know friends and have family members who attend church but are not saved and don't know if they're saved. I appeal to you. Get them saved. Teach them what the scripture says and help them to, to appropriate salvation. Uh, so many people know about salvation. They know about Jesus in their minds, but they have not given their hearts over to the Lord. We're talking about commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Commitment 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. I, it, it scares me. It scares me, Jackie Fisher, to know the number of people who are taking a chance. They're gambling with their lives every day, every day. They are gambling with the Lord. They're playing games with God. They're trying. They're oh, I'm, I'm going to keep drinking my liquor. Uh, to, I'm going to keep drink smoking my cannabis. I'm going to keep doing my drugs, and I'm going to keep uh, uh, having sex with uh, uh, so and so's wife. They're gambling with God on a daily basis. I'm talking about church going folks, ladies and gentlemen. They're gambling with God because they think that somehow God's going to wave a magic wand just before they die, and they're going to have a chance to repent. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, and God has given us over and over and over and over and over again opportunities to get saved and know that we're saved, and, and the Bible warns us about putting off salvation. I know so many people who are uh, so so caught up in their sins. They love gambling. They love uh, 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 playing the lottery. They love playing their scratch-off cards. They love going to the casino. They love uh, having sex with somebody else's partner. They love uh, 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 gr being greedy for money. They love lying. They love cheating. They love hi hanging out with lying and, and deceptive politicians and leaders. But ladies and gentlemen, the day is going to come where it's going to be you and God, you and God, and you're going to have to stand before Almighty God and give an account of the things done in this body, this temple that God has lent, loaned you. And so I've got to give an account also. And the Bible says, there thou art inexcusable, O man. And so there be no excuse when God says, well, what did you do my, with my son Jesus? And, and if he, even if you say, well, God, I built churches, uh, I gave money to the poor, I helped dig wells for water in Africa, I uh, uh, flew supplies into Venezuela, I did this. But what did you do about Jesus? Did you receive him? Oh, yeah, God, I went to church every Sunday. I heard the message. I can tell you what Pastor so-and-so uh, uh, preached last Sunday. And, and God's going to say, depart from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. And so the Lord is, is giving us a stern warning. Depart from me, he will say. I never knew you. And he only knows those who receive them in their hearts, not in their heads. Ladies and gentlemen, there are churches full of people today who have Jesus in their head. They have an intellectual knowledge of Jesus. They've heard about him all their lives. They have an intellectual knowledge of the Bible, but they have not appropriated Jesus Christ. And Jesus gives us a way, <clears throat> a way to do this. He says in over 11 times in the Bible, come unto me, come. He says also in another uh, passage, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And the Lord uh, is, has given us again and again and again that, that we've got to take action to get saved. Take action. We've got to actively ask him for salvation. We've got to actively invite him to come into our lives. It's like the painting that was made by Holman Hunt many years ago. Holman Hunt, uh, uh, the artist, did a, a, a painting, a depiction of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And on that door, there was no latch, no knob for him to turn to get in. There was no latch, no door. And so the art critics criticized Holman Hunt and said, oh, this is terrible art. Look, there's, he even, and they laughed at him. The artist left the knob off the door. There's no latch on the door. And Holman Hunt, in his, in his humility, said to the art critics, but you don't understand the gospel. Jesus is not going to push the door in. He's not going to turn the knob or the latch. He said in his word, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and live with him and he with me. And so the Lord wants us to actively open the door. And there is only one way we can actively open the door, ladies and gentlemen, to receive Jesus. 
And that's what this message is all about today. We're going to talk about 40 things that happen when you actively open the door. But Jesus will not come in. You can go to church for 90 years. You can be the oldest, long, longest living church goer in the world. You can be in Guinness's uh, book of records. But if you have never actively opened the door for Jesus to come in, because the knob to the door is not on the outside, the latch is not on the outside, the only way to open the door is to turn the knob on the inside. The knob is on the inside of your heart, not your mind, your heart. Jesus wants to live in our hearts. He says, let this mind be in you, but Jesus wants a heart relationship with each of us. And so there are millions of people sitting on the church. They have an intellectual relationship with Jesus, but an intellectual relationship will not save you. You cannot get to heaven based on your intellect or what you know. Even the devil knows there's a God, but you must be born again. And the new birth, ladies and gentlemen, comes when you open your heart to Jesus, when you turn the knob of your heart, when you take the lock off your heart, when you circumcise the foreskin of your heart, where you soften your heart, and you, when you open your mouth. The only way to uh, receive Jesus is to open your mouth and claim him and ask him, invite him. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him, and he with me. And so you open the door. You can open the door, listeners. You can open the door, David Carter, tell them in Dubai. You can open the door by asking Jesus to come in. When you ask him to come in, you turn the lock. You turn the latch. You turn the knob. And it's by confessing. And the Bible teaches us in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you will confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart, not your mind, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's how people get saved, ladies and gentlemen. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what color they are, doesn't matter what kind of house they live in, doesn't matter uh, 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 who their mama was, who their daddy was, doesn't matter what that person has done, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. We see this in Jesus' ministry, his earthly ministry. When he met the woman at the well, they talked about water, and Jesus said, I have water. If you drink this water, you will never thirst again. And she said, give me this water. And she had to ask for that water, ladies and gentlemen. She said, give me this water. And she asked, believing. And then she got saved, and she went running down the hill. She left her water pots at the well. She ran into the village, saying to the people, come, see a man. He told me all about himself. And that, uh, and Jesus stayed in that village for three days as people asked him for salvation and received the living water. The Bible tells us that if we believe in him, out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water, not streams, but <clears throat> rivers of living water. And you don't get this living water by reading about Jesus and taking notes and thinking about him and intellectualizing on him as they do in seminaries and in many Bible schools, and especially in most of our churches, they intellectualize about Jesus. Pastors, you need to stop preaching those intellectual sermons and get real and touch the hearts of the people and tell them you must be born again. You must open your heart to receive Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing, I mean, the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, so many of churches, they teach people that because you're born uh, in a certain family, you're a Christian, and they christen you at the age of eight years, of eight years, eight days old. At eight days old, they christen you. In other words, they anoint you. They go through the christening thing, and you become, according to that theology, you become a member of the body of Christ. That's a lie, ladies and gentlemen. That is not the truth. 
The Bible says, as Jesus told Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. So every one of us is born once. And that first birth is uh, a birth of flesh. We're born of water. We're born of water, meaning we are born and we become flesh. We are born of corruptible seed. Th that seed, that uh, uh, that sperm that met the uh, egg, uh, that met uh, the egg in our mother's womb, and and and, and formed the zygote, and formed the uh, a, a new being. That sperm meeting that egg was corrupt. And no matter how innocent you and I looked when we came out of the womb, we were corrupt. Our nature was corrupt. Sin was in our nature. Why? Because Adam sinned against God and rejected the kingdom of God. And all mankind was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Why? Because we were born of Adam's seed, which is a, a, a corrupt, ungodly seed. It was a wicked seed a seed that de denied God and, and was corrupt. It's unrighteous. And so every child born is born of a corrupt seed. And that is why God said, I look for a man among, a man among them who will stand in the gap before me and make up the hedge. But I found none. And so God decided he would save mankind himself. And God, the Son, Jesus Christ, said, Father, prepare me a body. I'll go down and live among them, and I will, I will do what needs to be done. I will live among them without sin, and I will bring the church home singing. I'm going to bring the church home uh, to glory, to give you the glory. I'm going to take away their sin. I'm going to destroy that wicked seed. I'm going to destroy that corruptible seed. I'm going to cause them to be born again by an incorruptible seed, and then uh, I will establish my church and then I will bring them home singing glory and praise and honor to you because that's how you made mankind in the first place. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I know we're going to, we're, we're, I'm going to read you eventually a list of 40 things that happened. I'm going to get there, but I want to lay this foundation so that there's no doubt in your mind that these truths are what God wants us to receive. Too many people are dying without a, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They have a head knowledge. Oh, they went to church. And, and the churches, I mean, they, they glorify these people. They lay them out in caskets. They look good. They're dressed up. They look all holy and all that. But ladies and gentlemen, a lot of folks in those caskets are not holy. They were not holy. They went to church. They, they, a lot of people know how to do that churchy thing. You know, if I go to the right church, I, I'll be socially correct politically correct. I mean, people know how to play the game, but it is no game, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to eternal life. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so, uh, pastors, uh, the true message of salvation should have four, per four points. A true message of salvation, and I'm saying this because there are people who do not get true messages of salvation. There are people hearing sermons, they're hearing sermons, everything about how to bake a chocolate cake, uh, to how to uh, 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 fish for crappies in Georgia, and, or, or how to bait your hook, or uh, how to live the glamorous life. I mean, people are getting all kinds of sermons, but God wants people to hear how to get saved, how to enter into his kingdom. He wants to be our God. He doesn't want to destroy anybody. He wants us to come to repentance. He wants us to cease from sin and to live a glorious, righteous life before him. And so these are four things. And, and as I said earlier, I'll give you a hard copy of these things later if you uh, suggest them, request them from me. Number one, Christ was delivered by God, the Father, to the punishment of death. God delivered his son, Jesus, so that Jesus could be put to death. Jesus prayed, Father, if this cup, uh, if it be at all possible, remove this cup from me. If there's any other way we can do this, 
Remove this bitter cup. Jesus did not want to taste that, that cup of death. He knew what he had to go through. But then he prayed, Yet nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. We need to take an example from Jesus. Nevertheless, not my will, God, but thy will be done. Jesus submitted his will to the will of the Father and agreed to face death. So God delivered Jesus over to death so that we can, could have our sins removed. Number two, Christ was buried. After he died, he was buried. The Bible gives us the account of, of them burying him in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible gives us an account of Mary and the ladies who went uh, uh, on the third day to anoint his body because his body had not been given the proper burial, okay, according to Jewish custom. So Jesus was buried. Number three, uh, God raised him from the dead on the third day. This is the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. All this stuff about baking chocolate cakes and how to fish for crappies and how to live the abundant life and how to live the prosperous life or this prosperity plan or this blessed plan or getting this prayer cloth or getting this whatever, ladies and gentlemen, that has nothing at all to do with Jesus Christ. The gospel is all about God delivering Jesus up to death so that you and I can have our sins removed. And, num and then number two, Christ was buried. He was dead, ladies and gentlemen. He was dead for three days. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, no other person on earth had ever had the power to die and raise himself from the dead. We saw Lazarus being raised by Jesus from the dead. We saw the, the Amalekite soldier being thrown into a cave that contained the bones of Elijah, and that man came back to life when his body, his dead body touched the, the, the quickened bones of Elijah. But never before in history and never again will anyone be able to give up their life and raise himself from the dead. This is the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. And number four is that if you will appropriate this, if you will ask for this, you will receive eternal life. This is the gospel. Number one, God gave up Jesus to die for our sins. Number two, Jesus was buried. Number three, God raised him from the dead. Number four, that if you will ask Jesus to come into your heart, he will come. Not into your head, into your heart. If you will ask him for the new birth. In other words, when you ask him to come into your life, you're giving up all your hope in anything else or everything else. You're giving up your hope and trust in the Lodge, in the Masonic Order, the Order of the Eastern Star, or the Elks, or, or the, 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 uh, 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 the Moose, whatever your Lodge is, the VFW, the uh, AARP, uh, uh, ACLU. You're giving up all your trust in them, and you're putting your trust in the blood of Jesus Christ and the fact that he died to take away your sins. He was buried. God raised him from the dead. And by faith in these things, you're asking Jesus to come into your life. That's what salvation is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, why is it so difficult for people to sit up in church for years and stubbornly refuse to open their mouths and ask Jesus to come in? Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. So praise God. So that's what the gospel is all about. And any preaching that does not include the gospel, ladies and gentlemen, preachers, you're going to be held accountable. You're going to be held accountable. You're going to be held accountable for leading people astray. You're going to be held accountable. I don't want to be held accountable for preaching any gospel other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now, these are the things that happen when you're saved. 
I know some of you got your pen and pencil around handy, and but you're not going to be able to keep up with this, so email me. I'll email you this hard copy. I'll email you this information. Number one, when you're born again, you receive everlasting life. You receive it. John 3.16 tells us you receive everlasting life. When you receive Jesus, when you open the door and invite him into your heart by faith, he comes in and you receive not only Jesus, but everlasting life. And nothing, nothing, I say nothing can take that everlasting life from you. Number two, when you uh, receive Jesus, you're born again. I mean, you are born again. No matter what you have done, you may have robbed banks, you may have robbed convenience stores, you may have uh, 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 slept with millions of, of, of uh, men's wives, but when you confess and repent and receive Jesus in your life, you're born again, and those sins and iniquities are removed. Number three, you're born of incorruptible seed, incorruptible seed. The seed that uh, 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 was planted in your mother's womb was corrupt. It was corrupt because of the sin nature in man, no matter who you are. The seed that produced me was incorruptible, was, was corruptible seed. In other words, that seed leads to death. No matter what kind of life I would live without Jesus, that seed would lead to, to death. No matter who my daddy is, no matter what he did, his seed was corrupt. And, and my children, their seed is corrupt. No matter how much I think of myself, my children, whom I place the seed, that, that my seed uh, met with their, their mother's egg, and, 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 and they were born, that seed is corrupt. They, too, must be born again. And so uh, when, when you're born again, you're born of incorruptible seed, ladies and gentlemen, incorruptible seed, which gives everlasting life. Number five, you become a son or daughter of God. Uh, the Bible says son of God. You become a son of God. Now, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we become an adopted son, an adopted daughter of God. Jesus is the only begotten, the only uh, one that God fathered, but he gives us a new birth, and he accepts us in the beloved as a part of his family, and he becomes our father. We become, number six, a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17 a new creation. You're not the old uh, uh, liar, cheater, whoremonger, uh, uh, deceiver that you used to be. You are a new creation. Now, whether you choose to c continue lying and deceiving and fornicating and, and gambling, that's up to you. The choice is yours. But as far as God is concerned, you become a new creation and you have the opportunity to live a holy and righteous life. You don't have to choose to go back and let the old man take over. The Bible says we've been passed from death to life. So when people ask you, are you born again? Are you saved? You can say yes. If they say, are you going to heaven when you die? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They would, and if people say, if you die today, are you going to heaven? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Why? Because we have been passed from life, I mean from death unto life. John 5, 24. Number eight, we've been exempted from future condemnation. The Bible tells us we will not be condemned. John uh, 5, 24. We have been ex exempt. You don't have to worry about being condemned by God uh, when you receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. So open the door. You turn that knob. And let him in. How do you turn that up? By asking him, Lord Jesus, come in and be my Savior, my Lord. Number nine, you've been redeemed from under the law. Number ten, uh, you've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Number eleven, you become dead to the law. Number twelve, you receive an eternal redemption. Number thirteen, you are reconciled to God. God accepts us. In his family, ladies and gentlemen, when we're born again. You have peace with God, Romans 5, 21. Number 15, you're justified. Justified, meaning just as if I have never sinned. You become righteous and just in God's sight. Number 16, all trespasses 
are forgiven you. All of your sins are forgiven. Number 17, you're delivered from the power of darkness. Number 18, you're translated into the kingdom of the Son of God. Yes, you'll continue living in America or Ethiopia or Kenya or Russia or China or wherever you live, but you're translated. You become a citizen of heaven. Number 19, you're perfected forever. God con considers you perfect. Yes, you, you may not have it all together. You may still have habits and, and things you're working on, but in God's sight, you're perfected forever in his sight. Hebrews 10, 14. No sins you will be remembered. God will not remember your sins. Your mama may remember them. Your brothers and sisters may remind you at the family reunion, but God forgets your sins. Number 21, your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. Now, the east cannot meet the west. It's, it's impossible for the east to meet the west. Your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. Number 22, you've been made complete in Christ. You're whole. You're complete. You're no longer messed up, fragmented. Number 23, you are accepted of God. God accepts you. He accepts you in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. Number 24, you are born of the Spirit of God. You're born of the Spirit of God. That's the new birth. That's salvation. God's Spirit births a new you, ladies and gentlemen. Number 25, you're baptized by the Spirit of God. Now, don't confuse with the baptism in the Holy Ghost. You're baptized by the Spirit of God into the church. The Spirit of God baptizes you into the church. Just as water baptism is a testimony that you're a new creature, the Spirit of God baptizes you into the church, the body of Christ. That's how you get in church, ladies and gentlemen. You must be baptized into the church. You don't join the church. You don't uh, get to, into the church by being born into a certain family. You don't get into the church by being baptized at the age of 13. You must be born into the church by the Spirit of God. Number 26, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit, the moment you receive the new birth, the Holy Spirit begins to live in you, and he will never leave you. And then it's up to you to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Number 27, we're almost finished. Being sealed, you're sealed with God's Spirit. You're sealed. In other words, you're covered. You're sealed. It's like writing a letter and signing your name and putting a wax over it, a wax, an impenetrable wax. Your name is sealed. Your name is sealed uh, by the Holy Spirit. Number 28, you become the object of God's love. Ladies and gentlemen, you ain't seen love yet. Get born again, and then you'll really experience love from God. Number 29, you become the object of God's grace. Grace and mercy, the twins start hanging out with you. You start, you start hanging out with, with new people, new companions. You, you look around and you see all these wonderful things happening with, to you because the twins, the twins, grace and mercy, begin following you. David says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Number 30, you become the object of God's power. We're almost finished. Number 31, you become the object of God's faithfulness. You'll find him to be faithful, faithful, faithful. Jackie Fisher, we're talking about a faithful God. Number 32, you become a citizen of heaven. You have a citizenship. You have a citizenship. You are, hey, ladies and gentlemen, you are not undocumented. As far as heaven is concerned, you are not undocumented. Uh, you become a citizen of heaven. Number 33, you become seated with Christ in heavenly places. Just as he sits on the throne of God, you become the moment you are saved, you, be, you sit with him on that throne of God in heavenly places. Number 34, oh, this is good. This is good. You become glorified. 
You become glorified. God glorifies you. He no longer sees you as a sinner. He glorifies you. He gives you his godly status. Number 35, you are given, given a home in heaven. I got a home up in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? Ain't that good news? You can tell people, they look at you like you're crazy, but tell them, I got a home up in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? I got a home up in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? And then number 36, you are kept by the power of God. You say, well, Pastor Carter, what keeps you? What keeps you going on from Sunday to Sunday? Sometimes you're sick. Sometimes you don't feel like it. Sometimes you don't feel like going to work. Sometimes you don't feel like directing the school of prophecy. Sometimes you don't feel up to it. But I'm led by the Spirit of God. I'm kept by the Spirit of God. And you're kept by the Spirit of God. And then number 37, you're crucified with Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, just as Christ was nailed on the cross, the Bible says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You are crucified with Christ. Retroactively, you are nailed on that cross with Jesus Christ, and you uh, identify with his sufferings. Number uh, 38, you are buried with Christ. You and I, Romans 6, read chapter uh, 6 of Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue to live any longer in it? For uh, uh, we know that as Christ was raised up from the dead, even so ought we to walk in newness of life. We've been buried with him by baptism unto death. Number 39, we are resurrected with Christ. Ephesians 2 and 6 tells us that we are resurrected with Christ. We are resurrected. That's, that's why we can say, I'm a new man. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things have passed away. I've been born again. More than a conqueror, that's what I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. See, you don't get this sitting up in church intellectualizing. You've got to open that door. When the Lord says, come unto me, when the Lord says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, when the Lord says, if anyone will open the door, I'll come in and open with him. When he says, ask and it shall be given, seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall open, open, open it. Do it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow might be too, too late. Tomorrow you might have to stand before God in, in, at the throne and give an account of the life you live in this flesh. Don't put off so great salvation. And then add number 40. Add number 40. Hallelujah. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Read the book of Revelation. When the Lamb of God opens his book, there's a list of names of all who are saved. Those names have been written in the blood of Jesus and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And your name will be read from the book of life. Your name, the moment you accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and sealed by the Holy Ghost. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just, we've just rushed through 40 things that happened to you when you are born again, these things have happened to the majority of you. There are some of you listening, you're not saved yet, but the moment you ask Jesus to come into your life and save you, you will be saved. That's a promise. These things will happen to you. All these things, plus more. This, this list is not the exhaustive list. There are many more things that happen to you when you're born again. Email me for this list. Call me for this list. But most of all, most of all, stay right where you are. And if you're already saved, then you ought to enter into prayer with me right now that we pray that people who are not saved will be saved. If you're listening today, whether it's live or listening by way of the recording, and you want to be born again, you may have been attending church for 10 years. You may go to church 13 times a Sunday. You may be, uh, be listening to uh, sermons on, on, on the radio or on the TV or the Internet 
but yet you have not taken the appropriate action. There is an action that must take place in order to appropriate the, the, the eternal life. You've got to open your mouth, not your mind. A lot of people open their minds and read about salvation and read about Jesus, but you've got to open your mouth and confess with your mouth whatever uh, the Bible says, uh, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Jesus said, I set before you life and death, uh, blessings and cursings. Choose life. Make your choice of life today by confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. How do you confess it? By opening your mouth and praying. Pray this prayer with me. Pray this prayer with me right where you are. If you're uncertain about salvation, you don't know, you're not sure, pray this prayer with me. Intercessors, pray this prayer with me. And those who are uh, uh, online, those who are listening to the tape, let's pray. God will hear your prayer. Pray something like this. Pray after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you died for my sins, that you were buried, that you rose again the third day. I now repent of my sins and come to you for mercy and forgiveness. By faith in your promise, I receive you personally as my Savior and confess you as my Lord. Come into my heart. Give me eternal life and make me a child of God. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 If you have prayed that prayer, no matter what your life has been like, no matter what you've been doing, you are now born again by the Spirit of God. You are now accepted in the Beloved. You are now a recipient of these 40 things that I've just listed that happened. You, you are now a child of God. You are now sanctified, set apart. You are now justified by God. So contact me for this list. I'll email them to you. Most of all, now that you're saved, now you tell somebody else. You go and tell them about salvation. You go back to your local church, you, you attend a local church, and you tell the pastor, I've been born again. I've been born again. I've received Jesus as my Savior and Lord. You get into a Bible study. You get into the Word of God. Praise God. Praise God. And if I can help you in any way, give me a call, send me an email, send me a text message, and we'll be glad to pray for you. Praise God. We bless God. We bless God. We bless God. I thank you, Lord, for this message today. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your anointing. Thank you for saving souls. In Jesus' name, I ask you to stay online, those of you who are alive, and those of you who are listening by way of the video. I pray that this will have helped you. Contact me, and, and, and if we can help you in any way, we'd be glad to pray for you and encourage you.